Hello ladies and gentlemen, it's been a while. Happy New Year's. I've been trying to figure out what to talk about. Now, I did have an incident recently where I did get to go to the safari area of the San Diego Zoo and we got to see their conservation efforts. The northern white rhino has a massive population decline. It's, uh, if I remember correctly, it's so bad there's only two left in the whole world from what I heard uh, from when I went there, and they happen to be mother and daughter, so that's a bit of an issue. But they're doing a program to work with the southern white rhino. Now, while I was there, I had a few ideas for technology and new things they could use to optimize their process, but in all likelihood, it would all be for nothing, as it is a nonprofit organization that can't exactly afford all the high end upgrades. So, if you do find a way to donate to that, I would say very much do go ahead and donate to that. There's a lot of work that they're doing. They're doing research into how to grow white rhino stem cells and how to inject them essentially for in vitro fertilization into southern white rhino surrogates, which has proven a bit difficult. And their research has actually gone well enough on the genetic side. It turns out that stem cells, when they're working with them, do have a tendency to want to pick what they want to be. They uh, start like a little kid. I want to be an architect when I grow up. I want to be an engineer. I want to be this. I want to be that. And they pick what cell they form into. They can do it spontaneously, which is something they're trying to mitigate. right? And uh, there's something that definitely can be learned in terms of how to get the production right and how to get everything done right. But that's for another video uh, for today. We've got this video here. Can we terraform the Sahara to stop climate change? And as I was watching it, and I've only seen it once already, and not even all the way through, but I have seen enough to, eh, to have a few alternate suggestions to talk about here. So I could also provide some information for the green energy roadmap that people have been talking about for a little while and all the different proposals and my basic idea for it. So Let's go ahead and take a look at this video from Real Engineering, which has proven to be a rather interesting video, and I'll go ahead and edit in some images that I make in Photoshop a little bit later to show some of the potential issues that I have with the way this is done. This episode of Real Engineering is brought to you by Brilliant, a problem-solving website that teaches you to think like an engineer. We have been hearing it for years. Climate change is happening. What I'm about to present to you is fact. These are reliable measurements with multiple peer-reviewed papers confirming the information. There are some issues occasionally with peer-reviewed information. Like I did here, there was one peer-reviewed scientific article that was supposed to be a joke, but it actually got passed through accusing male genitalia of climate change. So it is important to validate who's validating these because it turns out that article was validated by journalists. Now, I'm not saying this to the discredit of all scientific articles. I am saying that sometimes there are incidents where false information does get through despite the peer review process so it is okay to rely on this information it's it's okay but definitely be sure to validate the measurements and double check the numbers and coordinate with real-time data sources to see if their recent estimates line up and to try and find archived evidence if you can if you have that effort for the most part this is more reliable than any blog or just you know, throwing stuff out willy-nilly, but it is worth considering that there may be occasional discrepancies, so take things with a grain of salt. When there's enough sources talking about it, then yeah, it is valid enough. It is fairly, fairly valid, right? But overall, the conclusions he's reaching here in this video are reliable enough that I wouldn't really question the validity of these sources too much. They're mostly good to go, but if you feel a need to scrutinize, go right ahead. That's the beauty of science. It's open for scrutiny. If you want to test something to see if it works right, come on in, the more the merrier. Atmospheric carbon dioxide levels are the highest they've been in over 400,000 years, confirmed by our analysis of hundreds of samples of Arctic ice cores, tree cores, and isotope ratios in fossils. Average global temperatures have risen by 0.8 degrees Celsius since the Industrial Revolution began. And while temperatures have risen, it turns out that some of the sensors being used to measure global temperatures are in areas that were when they were established in open fields, but has since become populated around. Like for example, there's some uh, thermometer systems that are used for global temperature measurements out in Orange County, not too far from where I live. Uh, it started out back in the 50s and 60s when they were doing these initial measurements and setting up the technology, even in the 70s to some extent, not very densely populated. But look today, it's one of the most densely populated places in America right now, Los Angeles, which is insane. And that could be throwing off some of the measurements. But at the same time, there is a 
detail that temperatures are in fact rising, right? And while it may not look like a substantial amount, think about how much energy is stored, right? So think about how many joules per gram Kelvin we're talking about with the air, the thermal density, right? Like that's not actually the thermal density, it's the, uh, damn, I forget what the term is for it. But if you think about it, even though air for a small amount of mass has a fairly low energy density related to temperature, or is that if you do look at that measure, the change in temperature will indicate a change in overall energy in the atmosphere, and that overall energy has ballooned quite a bit. So while some people take a look at these temperature changes and they're like, eh, who cares? It's like, it's half a degree, it's one degree, what's that blah blah blah, what's that gonna do? Surprisingly a lot, you know, you'd be surprised. With two thirds of that change occurring since 1975, the evidence is overwhelming. This is fact, you are wrong if you deny it. For those of you who are wondering, I'm not denying it, I'm just saying some of the information may be a little bit different due to setup failures that are by all means no fault of the people who established that they didn't predict that some of these things would happen, right? Like population growth around the sensors. But overall, the trend is reliable enough. All right, I'm not denying it, I'm just saying they're, you know, could, be, ha could have been done a little better, but we've got what we've got and we're ready to work with it. If these trends continue, and I really shouldn't say if because they will continue, we are going to continue seeing stronger storms, more heat waves and droughts, sea levels will continue to rise even after the ice caps have vanished in the summer months in about 30 years. Pretty much. And to really make you motivated to care about this, the world's economy will suffer. Depends. With the abundance of resources in the air, you could theoretically produce new economic goods. I have heard there are... Uh... There's TED Talks about being able to grow graphene or carbon nanotubes from carbon emitted by engines right, as a way of carbon capture. So that opens market opportunities. So that's, it could work, right? And that would be a remedy to the issue, which would kind of go along with what he's saying. If we don't remedy the issue, we lose the economic capacity to keep moving forward because of all the disruption that would occur. But at the same time, this is producing a potential market which is, I think, a good thing because it motivates a response to the issue. We have been making strides in the technology required to reduce our emissions of carbon dioxide, but the changeover is happening too slowly. The most I also think we're a little misguided on that. More on that later. The effective thing our world has done in the past 10 years in battling carbon emissions was going through a global financial crisis. What? Now, hold on a second. Hold on. So... Because our industry plummeted because we couldn't afford it, that was the best thing that happened. I think that there's a lot better yet to come. Countries like my own are continually missing carbon targets. We're going to face up to 600 million euro in fines every year after 2020 until we fulfill our promise of reducing our carbon emissions by 20%. That money is going to come out of our pockets through carbon taxes. Maybe then we will start to take climate change seriously. It's not that climate change isn't being taken seriously, it's that the technology is not ready. Take a look at solar energy, which he does bring up later, which I have a bit of an issue with, which is what I'm going to talk about. Well, the problem is solar energy, as it is right now, requires 10 times the subsidies of all energy sources combined to even have a foothold in the market. And it is remarkably inefficient compared to some of the other energy sources that are out there, not to mention potential environmental damage due to the manufacturing process. And if you're not going with photovoltaic and you're going with the solar thermal method, which is having a bunch of mirrors focus light onto a salt tower, that cooks birds out of the air. They call them streamers for a reason. <sighs> Smoke ball. You know. So we've got to work with changing our energy sources and working on making them work better, right? There are some innovations that are really good. I can bring those up later, but for now, let's just see what he's got to say about that terraforming the Sahara. We aren't making significant decreases in carbon dioxide emissions. We've only really leveled out, which is not good enough. So okay. if we aren't making a difference by reducing emissions, maybe we can reverse climate change. Maybe we can engineer our climate. Yeah. And there has been multiple suggested methods of doing that. In this new video series, we're going to explain how several geoengineering methods intend to work and their potential impact on the world's climate. The first plan we will examine is afforestation. Okay. Afforestation is pretty self-explanatory. Plant trees allow them to grow and store carbon in their wood. 
The problem we run into is finding large enough spaces to plant forests that would have a significant impact on the climate and that would not negatively affect the economies of the countries employing the method. Taking land that could be used for agriculture just isn't a realistic solution. No one is going to agree to it. Our options are limited, but we happen to have huge expanses of land on Earth that are not being used for anything productive. Deserts. Now I know what you're thinking. Deserts are not the best place for growing anything, but with water desalination technology rapidly advancing, this isn't as far-fetched as it may seem. Water is an expensive material to process and very energy intensive, which is something that he brings up. He brings up a solution to it, but I think he forgot to account for how many resources that took up. I don't, I haven't seen the entirety of the video. Again, maybe he does bring it up, so still a bit fresh for me, but there's issues with using the, the deserts as a fertile growing grounds, but again, a little bit later, let's get to this. I'm, we're bringing up details, all right? So, terraforming the Sahara, like it says in the title, modify the desert to make it a growable place. But there are some issues having to do with the very structure of the desert itself. We are going to examine the feasibility and effect of afforestation in the two largest subtropical deserts in the world, the Sahara and the Australian Outback. These are the perfect candidates for afforestation, neither have large competing human populations, agricultural activity, or large natural animal and plant populations. Conveniently, they are also in the subtropical zones where a 12-month growth cycle is possible, maximizing our carbon capture potential. To maximize our potential further, we need to pick a suitable tree. The tree we choose will need to be suited to this climate, be evergreen, grow rapidly, and be useful as a commercial resource. The Australian Eucalyptus grandis will be the candidate for this study, which also comes with the added benefit of being a habitat for these cute little shits. What about uh, wildlife issues? If you have eucalyptus in the desert, what if there's organisms that try to eat eucalyptus that wander through the desert? Let's say you have some really short uh, Australian eucalyptus trees and some camels come along and try to eat it. That's not good for their diet. Eucalyptus has waxy leaves that are very toxic which is why koalas have a specially adapted digestive tract for processing these leaves to handle the waxiness of them. They've co-evolved to become that mutually dependent food source. Move that somewhere else, where potentially other animals could ingest it. Now you have a problem. Before even bothering to worry about how this would be done, let's first see if it's worth being done. Let's first look at the Sahara as an example. Ultimately, we are trying to sequester atmospheric carbon dioxide by storing it in wood. Every 10,000 square meters could hold about 1,000 trees, and taking this patch of the Sahara between the 16 degree and 50 degree longitudes, we have about 9,800 billion square meters of land. Ignoring land needed for infrastructure, that's about 980 billion trees. Planting a forest of this size would increase the world population of trees by 33%. Assuming they grow with equal density, equal spacing, but there's a problem with that. If the trees get big enough, they take up enough space from each other, they block sunlight, so there's an optimization limit, right? So your carbon sequestration is going to plateau because they're going to be blocking out sunlight from each other. There's going to be potentially a slight dip down following this general trend, like not, not curving up on the end, but leveling out. So this dip here is going to be when the trees get big enough, they block sunlight from each other. That's something to consider and something to worry about when it comes to this. That's a lot of trees. Estimates show that this would capture between 6 and 12 gigatons of carbon per year for about a century, That's before good. it would meet a steady state where growth would slow and carbon dioxide in would equal carbon dioxide out. Exactly. 6 to 12 gigatons would capture between 16.3% and 32.6% of our emissions per year, with humans generating a total of 36.8 gigatons of carbon dioxide in 2017. Ideally, we wouldn't just let the trees grow and forget about them. We would systematically cut them down and use them for construction, synthetic feedstock, or convert them to liquid biomass fuel, which releases carbon, to replace our dwindling fossil fuel supplies and burn that fuel in a power plant with its own carbon capture technology. Carbon capture is inefficient to some extent. It actually will steal some energy from the process itself. So due to analyses of carbon capture technology, the end result is that we would have to burn even more fuels to substantially fix this. Although again, I do have a substantial fix that I'll bring up at the end of this video. I'm which sorry, would reduce so emissions much. further and produce new economies for these desert regions. Australia's desert is about 60% the size of the Sahara, and so we could add an additional 60% to that figure, to bring our best case scenario to just over 50% capture of our emissions per year. Okay. Bringing our emission levels per year down to levels equivalent to that of the 70s. 
On the surface, this seems great, but what effect would this actually have on our environment? There are multiple things we need to consider. First of all is the irrigation itself. A managed forest of this nature would need 500 millimeters per year of water, which equates to 4,900 billion meters cubed of water per year for this number of trees. Where is all this water going to come from and at what cost? Freshwater supplies are obviously rare in the Sahara, but surprisingly not as rare as the Australian outback. The world's largest groundwater aquifer actually resides beneath the Sahara and is shared by four countries, Egypt, Libya, Sudan and Chad. As part this technology still Right, I skipped past that because there is something that he brought up. Those countries don't want to give up their water supply. There's ethical issues in stealing water from these populations. So desalination is the way to go. The United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia in years, thanks in large part to countries like Israel, the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia who have invested in the technology and all get over 50% of their drinking water from desalination plants. This technology still requires energy and energy comes with a cost, but monetarily, and as a source of carbon dioxide. Molten salt reactors. That's what I'm saying, man. Continuous energy supply. You could use the thermal energy from the reactor to boil off water and distill it. You could use it as an energy generation source just as electrical energy. Whatever you want to do with it, you can hook it up and move it pretty much anywhere in the world. And considering you're out in a desert and molten salt reactors aren't prone to damage from water, they're actually chemically stable even at 750 degrees Celsius near water, it's quite amazing to see, even with lithium in the salts. Do you know that? There's lithium in the salts in molten salt reactors, and they still won't react with water. That's amazing. It requires approximately 1.5 kilowatt hours of energy to desalinate a meter cubed of water. Nuclear we then need that. to pump the water to a height for distribution. With the average elevation of the Sahara at 450 meters, this would require a further 2.5 kilowatt hours per meter cubed, bringing our total energy consumption to 4 kilowatt hours per meter cubed of water supplied. I would suggest using a turbine to, uh, to reduce the pressure and turn the water into vapors and send that vapor to the tube. So then there's also the issue for water hammer and potentially steam hammer. If there's condensation that builds up and it forms a big enough seal, it could rupture the pipes. So that would have been my suggestion, but keeping it as water continuously, that works well enough. If you could produce a very low pressure in the tube, if you could actually produce negative atmospheres of pressure, you could theoretically get the water up even more efficiently. That's how trees do it. They produce, I think it was, technically speaking, negative 10, negative 13 atmospheres of pressure, according to a Veritasium video, which is how trees are able to grow so astronomically tall. If you try to do that at zero atmospheres of pressure with a single bubble of air in the system, the water will flash boil and occupy that space and will refuse to go any further up than 20, 30 feet, I think. It's been a while since I've seen that video, so feel free to check it out. I'll probably link it in the description down below if I find it and you go ahead and see for yourself. The cost of this in terms of carbon footprint and actual cost will vary with the energy source used, but considering the location and nature of the project, a mix of solar power and biomass energy with carbon capture technology attached to its exhaust should be used. Again, efficiency losses with the carbon capture and biomass energy. Solar has a few issues and I will bring that up when he brings that up a little bit more in detail. I'll cover it up at the end of the video. Let's focus on a purely solar powered process for now, as biomass is more expensive and has a larger carbon footprint without carbon capture technology, though it would become cheaper as the project matures thanks to the cheap source of fuel on its doorstep. Solar energy costs about 10 cent per kilowatt hour with a median carbon footprint of 72 grams per kilowatt hour. Putting all this together, the total energy needed to irrigate this forest with 4,900 billion meters cubed of water will be 19,600 terawatt hours a year. That's 19.6 petawatts of energy that's already rivaling future global energy consumption projections, just so you know. At a cost of $1.96 billion a year and a carbon footprint of 1.4 gigatons of carbon a year. Ignoring infrastructure costs, which would likely push the initial costs into the trillions. This puts our total carbon capture for the Sahara at a best case scenario of 6 gigatons a year at a cost of $184 per tonne of carbon dioxide captured. Expecting poor African nations to fund this alone is unrealistic, so it would be reasonable to expect countries to pay for this project through carbon taxes, like those that will be placed on Ireland in 2020. And 
People are not going to be happy about that. Ireland's already getting a kick in the pants with the whole Brexit thing. They don't want to become a vassal state. They don't want to have to pay additional taxes to the EU. They don't want to have their money funneled out to another country. This is one of the big issues, especially in politics. Britain's leaving because they don't want to foot the bill for the EU. Germany, being one of the biggest economies there, is now having issues because with Britain gone, they won't be able to afford a lot of the expenses of the EU. France and Germany are going to have to foot the bill for a lot of the countries in the EU that can't afford to foot the bill for themselves. They're an economic union, and they're not doing very well at that, from what I've heard. So it, I don't expect that this is going to work, and I don't think that solar is going to be the viable option. Thus allowing them to offset their own carbon emissions with funding to the project. A litre of petrol, when burned, emits approximately 2.6 kilograms of carbon dioxide. Thus placing a carbon tax of about 48 cent per litre of petrol could pay for the project, if we sell 4 billion litres of petrol with the added carbon tax. Who wants to pay an extra half a buck per litre of fuel, hmm? Tell me. I'm waiting. Which is about the total petrol and diesel. Just so you know, in Los Angeles, we are angry about a 5 or 10 cent increase on our gas tax. Consumption of a small country like Ireland. So it's possible at a high cost, but if the project can stop climate change, maybe it's worth it. That's the next problem we need to address. What effect will the forest actually have on the world's environment? With the help of climate models, we can start to get a clearer picture of what all this money and effort would give us. Temperature being the top of our list of concerns. Local temperatures would be affected most due to the evaporative cooling caused by the increase in soil moisture. This would seed clouds and increase local precipitation substantially, allowing us to reduce our ongoing costs. Here's the problem. The soil in the desert is going to be very porous, all right? It's going to be silty. Well, it's not really going to be like clay soil. It's going to be very loose, all right? You have very dry particles that are not going to hold water very well. It's going to seep. That's why deserts aren't good for growing plants most of the time, because the water escapes. If you take a look at aloe vera, you plant it in clay soil, it's going to struggle because the roots aren't strong enough and, st and thick enough to punch their way through the clay, which is what plants that grow in clay soil do. Clay can hold water really well, but when it's dry, it'll shed water, which is annoying, which is why plants that grow in clay soil have very good water conservation capabilities. Take a look at California native plants that do that naturally, especially one of my favorites, the Nevins barberry. Very tart fruit, very interesting, tiny little, you know, little berry fruit. But there's a few of them left in the world, so I do encourage conservation efforts for that. But it grew in the clay soil near the Golden Gate Bridge before it was displaced. And it grew really well. It's a very good plant for conserving water. Now, on the other hand, you have very silty soil, sort of like really like conventional kind of muddy, nice stuff. It'll hold water really well. You can grow plants in that quite nicely. Plants that grow in sandy soil, like aloe vera, have to pick up water quickly, but their roots don't have to be as strong because the sand will be displaced more easily. The problem is the seepage. Growing a bunch of trees in an area with that seepage is going to be the Achilles heel of the project. Because you have to keep pumping water in and it will escape. Not to mention the sand is not going to retain moisture and nutrients well. You can import the nutrients with the water very easily. You could even attach other species of plants to that water supply and they could provide nutrients into the soil. You put cover crops in your irrigation system. That would help offset the cost. But there's also the issue of the crossover point when it comes to how much land you use for solar and how much land you use for the plants. And that's what I think he missed when he ran the numbers. That's the thing, because you'd have to have the energy on the borders and you'd have Sorry about that. Oh crap, I've been going for 25 minutes already. Okay. So, ideally in that time I probably showed you just a quick hastily done graph to show you what I'm talking about. The amount of area you need to use for solar versus for trees, right? When they balance out, right? And those are just that's just a spitball graph with a couple of lines, all right? So, the graph coming up from the bottom is let's say that's solar, right? Now, 
the one going down from the top, that would be the trees. Now, how much energy do you need to produce from the solar in order to take care of all the trees, right? And this is just a graph of land consumption. I'm not sure exactly how to run the, the uh, numbers for the energy system. You'd also have losses from the power lines. You'd have inefficiencies due to extreme thermal energy. Then there's the reliability of the solar, which is a big problem in terms of the longevity of this project. You put forward an estimate of 100 years until the forest starts running into issues. But the solar panels could be subject to damage as people try to salvage materials from them to make a living. This is a very impoverished part of the world, keep in mind, right? So now we have a potential issue on our hands with people stealing the resources to better their lives because they need a way to put food on the table. Not to mention the potential for damage due to the environmental corrosion and erosion, well, not corrosion, but erosion. You have sandstorms, right? That's going to scuff up the surfaces of your solar panels and screw them up pretty badly. That's gonna be an issue, all right? Not to mention, putting one species of plants in makes it a monoculture, which has some potential for failure. Monocultures are incredibly prone to disease. When you have a disease ripple through, it threatens the population. Take a look at banana growing. We have developed a monoculture, and there's a banana fungus that can ruin entire fields if you contaminate one plant. That's the dangerous thing about all this, right? So this is what, uh, it's very well intentioned. I'll give him that. Absolutely, no contest there. But I think there are better energy sources that we could turn to than solar and the wind because they're unreliable sources of energy. There was a green energy roadmap that somebody set using wind and solar all together, but there's problems with that because it would have a tremendously high cost. A nuclear option would be much cheaper, use much less land, open up other resources and availabilities. Take a look at the United States, for example. We throw away about 22.6 kilotons of rock and material. We throw away that much stuff every year in rare earth metal every single year in the state of Florida alone, and that's a massive economic boom if we can access that, but we throw it away due to contamination with radioactive particles like thorium, which makes for an incredibly fertile fuel for a molten salt reactor. If we were to use molten salt reactors, we could have mass production and access the rare earth metals that would make our economy much stronger and produce better electronics and better technology services here in the United States, reducing the shipping demands with China, right? That's it. We spend less time manufacturing in China where they have very low standards for their manufacturing and carbon emissions. The US has actually been reforesting and putting out less carbon emissions over the years, but according to the Paris Accord, China and India get to increase their carbon emissions, but we are still trying to fix that issue. So, the way we can fix this, because China and India have very high carbon emission rates as is, it's causing a lot of health problems. Beijing's already had to cut back on health standards for joining the military because of how bad the air quality is in Beijing. They can't get enough people into the military from Beijing to meet their quotas, so they have dropped the health standards. That's how bad it is. That's how bad the smog is. We take the manufacturing away from them. We eliminate that carbon production. It jeopardizes people's livelihoods. Sorry about that. Which is unfortunate, but there's not much that can be done in regards to that with the way that the Chinese are going about things. That's going to create an issue. If we can solve the issue domestically here, that's, that's us. That's our choice. That's what we do, right? It's unfortunate, right? By fixing one issue, we leave others hanging. This is the problem of having everything be so interconnected the way that it is. You start cutting away strings, there's going to be problems. But there could also be benefits, right? And that's the unfortunate thing about all of this. This is what makes it so complicated with environmentalism and covering all the different technological applications. Theoretically, this could be an amazing thing. This could be an amazing resource. If we had molten salt reactors running, we could directly catalyze the carbon emissions from carbon fuels. Hell, we could use molten salt reactors to convert coal and oil directly, chemically, into the things that we want to use for manufacturing with no carbon emissions. We can do that. That's what I think we should be focusing on instead of terraforming an entire desert and spending a lot of carbon to get things done. Also, Germany has moved to a highly wind and solar based energy source and their energy fluctuates. They have to, they have to pay their population to use energy 
during the day so that the power lines don't get fried, and at night they have to buy nuclear energy from France. Nuclear is cheap, it has the lowest death per kilowatt hour rate of any energy source in the world as we know of, all right? It is a constant supply, but we find better ways to utilize the fuel that opens up more economic resources for the goods that we are going to continue to produce regardless. These are the things to focus on. Talk to you guys again soon. Hey guys, this is post-production Matthew. Thank you for sticking around if you stuck around this long. Now, I do want to hear from you what you have to say going forward in regards to what you want to see from this channel. And keep in mind, I'm in college now, so I do have this semester off for now. I'm off winter, but I start up again in February. So if you want me to make a video from now until February or anywhere in between, let me know, okay? Likewise, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it got a little thought inspiring. If you want me to elaborate on molten salt reactors, I can gladly do that for you. If you want me to talk about something else or try my hand at animation again, sure. Just let me know. Have a nice day.